Good morning. We are so glad you're with us today. Man, it's going to be a great day, I believe. It already has been. Man, aren't we blessed to have a great praise team that just leads us to the Lord? I mean, man, we get spoiled around here, don't we? It's, a, it's good to be spoiled like that in the Lord, isn't it? A um, couple of announcements. The Membership 101 we've already mentioned. Uh, please, if you haven't signed up and you want to today, uh, please do. We have to give, we have materials that we'll give to you. We need to make sure we have enough. Uh, also, I'm starting a Bible study class uh, the Sunday after Labor Day, How to Study Your Bible. Uh, it'll start at 9.15 in the morning. We'll go till a little bit after 10 or so. Uh, I want to help you learn how to feed yourself the Word of God, okay? Uh, it, it's okay at this point to, to be fed, but as Christians, we're supposed to grow, Right, and that growth is expected. That growth happens in Christ, and you know sometimes we've got to take the spoon and the knife ourselves and do some do some cutting and do some eating, right? And so that's one thing that I want to do. It's the reason I'm, I, I do this class is I want you to to understand that you know you come to the Bible, you don't have to be intimidated. It's God's word, and we need to be in it every day, right? And so I just invite you to be a part of that class. We can only do. Uh, ten of us in that class because it's just limited room in that in that uh, room. But please sign up for that. I'd love to uh, just teach you how to study your Bible. Uh, also, who's your one? You see it over here. We've been focusing on leading one person to Christ. Each of us, if you haven't adopted somebody in your mind or in your heart, somebody that doesn't know the Lord yet, uh, I invite you to do so. Right? We're going to pray for them. We're going to pray for opportunities to share the gospel with them, and we're going to pray that they come to know the Lord. Uh, that's what we're here for. We are here, we are saved, and, and I am thankful that I am saved because somebody took the time to pray for me. A friend of mine invited me to church, and I went to church one day. I'm, I'm from an unchurched family, and uh, went to church one day, and it was just like the preacher was speaking to me, and uh, got saved the next day. And so that's, that's what we have the pleasure of doing, is to see more people's names written in the Lamb's Book of Life, right? Last week, we finished up the, the book of Jude. Last week, we talked about He is able. There's nothing the Lord can't do. Whatever you're going through, however it's, it's happening in your life, God is able to get you through it. But you've got to take it to Him. Okay, we try in our own strength to try to do things our way and in our own strength, and, and we can't do it. We just can't do it. That's why the Lord has made himself available through Jesus every second of every day. We're not supposed to carry our own burdens. That's why Jesus died on the cross. And so he is able. He is able. And then we talked about he is worthy. All the things that he's done for us, he is worthy of all the praise and adoration. He is worthy of our life itself. Because all he's done for us, we get to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords every day. Not just with our voices and not just coming in attendance to the church together, but we get to worship him with our very lives. That's what real worship is, is when the way that we deal with each other and the way that we work and the way that we are in our households and with our friends and families, those are the moments that... That worship is real with the Lord, how he's changed us, how we get to see it in our relationships. Today, for the next four Sundays, we're starting another just brief sermon series. It's called Nobodies. Nobodies. We can, as Christians, we can be enamored with a lot of people in the Bible that have names. Right, we can look up to Moses, right, David, there's a lot of people, Mary, Peter, a lot of us identify with Peter, right, there is a, a, a lot of people in the scriptures that, that we can also think is, you know, I'll never, I'll never be like David, right, I'll never, be. And, and so, in the midst of that, we think because we're not somebody 
famous in the scriptures, you know, like Ruth, or, or we're not leaving, living these lives that are just turning the world on its head, that for some reason that we have a less significant existence. And that's not the case. That is simply not the case. There are a lot of people in Scripture that had significant meaning, significant interactions for God's kingdom that have no name mentioned. Right? They are, if you will, nobodies according to the world standards. But understand today that there are no nobodies in the kingdom of God. None. You see, we all bear the image of God. Every one of us is significant in the eyes of God. Not one person here is insignificant to the Lord. He loves every one of us, and we each have a plan that God has made for us to walk in this life. Now, the devil has maybe convinced you that you have no meaning or that you're not significant enough, or I am just little old me. It's not the truth. If you're breathing today, if your heart is beating, then God has a special plan for your life. Without a doubt. He doesn't make junk. He doesn't make accidents. We are who we are, and when we come to the realization that that's the way God made us, then we can go forward in our plan. Too many times we live in a culture where everybody wants to be somebody else or be like somebody else. We need to be like us. There's never been another one like you ever created in the history of the world. You're valuable, you're not a nobody. So the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at some nobodies. Ones that aren't named in Scripture, but they had important roles in the kingdom of God, just like us. If there was a Bible written today, our names may not be in it. But hopefully a lot of our actions would. Join me. We're in 1 Samuel, beginning in chapter 14. And we're going to start in verse 1. Join me as we look at a nobody today, Jonathan's armor bearer, Jonathan's armor bearer. That same day, Saul's son, Jonathan, said to the attendant who carries his weapons, come on, let's cross over to the Philistine garrison on the other side. However, he did not tell his father. Saul was staying under the pomegranate tree in Migron and the outskirts of Gabeah. The troops were with him, numbered about 600. Ahijah, who was wearing an ephod, was also there. He was the son of Ahitub and the brother of Ichabod, son of Phinehas, son of Eli, the Lord's priest at Shiloh. But the troops did not know that Jonathan had left. There were sharp columns of rock on both sides of the pass that Jonathan intended to cross to reach the Philistine garrison. One was named Bozes and the other Sinai. And the other ones, one stood in the north in front of Michmash, and the other was south in front of Geba. Jonathan said to the attendant who carried his weapons, Come on, let's cross over to the garrison of these uncircumcised men. Perhaps the Lord will help us. Nothing can keep the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. His armor bearer responded, Do what is in your heart. You choose. I am right here with you, whatever you decide. All right, Jonathan replied, Let's cross, we'll cross over to the men, let them see us. If they say, wait until we reach you, then we will stay here, or we will stay where we are and not go up to them. But if they say, come on up, then we'll go up, because the Lord has handed them over to us. That will be our sign. They let themselves be seen by the Philistine garrison. The Philistine said, look, the Hebrews are coming up out of the holes where they've been hiding. The men of the garrison called to Jonathan and his armor bearer. Come on up. We'll teach you a lesson, they said. Follow me, Jonathan told his armor bearer, for the Lord has handed them over to Israel. Jonathan climbed up using his hands and his feet with his armor bearer behind him. Jonathan cut them down 
and his armor bearer followed and finished them off. In that first assault, Jonathan and his armor bearer struck down about 20 men in a half acre field. Terror spread through the Philistine camp and the open fields to all the troops. Even the garrison and the raiding parties were terrified. The earth shook and terror spread from God. Now, we start to look at this and we need a little background, right? First of all, Israel in chapter 9 called Saul to be the first king of Israel. Saul was a head taller than everybody else. He was handsome. He looked like a good worldly king, like all the other good kings that were in other countries, right? And so they called Saul, but Saul was not up for the task. Saul was a man that was a coward in many ways. He lacked courage. He was selfish, he was egotistical, he was arrogant, all those things, all those bad qualities of a good king. Chapter 13 happens, and there's a war between Israel and the Philistines. Saul had gathered his army, and he was just waiting. You look back in chapter 13, verse 3, Jonathan is the one that begins to, to fight. And then you read the next verses... Saul is the one that takes credit for the victories, not his son. You see, later on in chapter 13, they're waiting for Samuel to come. He's the first prophet here that they needed to deal with. He is the one that would come and do an offering to the Lord and ask his blessing upon their battle for direction and what to do next. And, and Saul was impatient. He said, Samuel's not here. I'll just do the offering myself, which was a huge no-no. Only the priest could do the offering. So Saul thought that he could do it, so he did it. And Samuel gets there and he says, Now the kingdom has been ripped away from you. There is one that God has called that has a heart for God. And you are not that man. So Saul is broken at this point, right? He doesn't know what to do next he has got all of these, he has all these troops and, and they're fighting the Philistines. And, and, and so what does he do? And so his son, Jonathan, is the only one with real courage. Saul has all the troops. 600 he has just with him, several miles from Michmash. I love saying that. Michmash. You want to practice that? Michmash. It's kind of fun. And they're several miles from there, from the battlefront. And Saul's just hanging out, as it says, underneath a pomegranate tree. He's chilling out. Jonathan, though, Jonathan has the design and he is courageous. Jonathan doesn't have all the troops. He doesn't have everything that he needs for this war, but he does have his armor bearer. That's what he's got. Jonathan and his armor bearer, his dad's got everything laid out, but his dad won't do anything. Here we see in this, in this passage of scripture, Jonathan goes to battle in the strength of the Lord with only an armor bearer beside him. Never underestimate the odds of your battle when God is on your side. Never. Jonathan knew that this was going to be a heck of a battle. And he figured if God is on my side, I think we got a good shot. The first thing, though, that we have to understand in this is that there was an overwhelming difficulty that they had to overcome. Okay? Jonathan and his armor bearer had to come this overcoming this overwhelming difficulty. First of all, when you look at this, you see back in chapter 13, verse 22, that there was, on the day of battle, not a sword or a spear could be found in the hand of any of the troops who were with Saul and Jonathan. You see, that was one of the biggest problems that they had, was that they had no weapons. How do you go to war with no weapons? The crazy thing is, the Philistines were the blacksmiths. The Philistines were the ones that made the weapons. They would hammer out the swords. They, were hammer, they would hammer out the, 
the metal points to the, to the spears, right? And, and they did everything. The Philistines did everything. The Israelites would just go and pay the Philistines to make the armor. Now they're in a war. The Philistines are well armored. The Israelites, the only two people that actually had metal weapons, were Saul, who never used them, and Jonathan, his son. Everybody else, all of the other Israelites, had bows and arrows. They had sticks. They had sticks that they would put rocks on the end and make a big hammer. They had slings that they could use. Very, very basic weapons. Man, that's a difficulty right there. Would you go into battle with somebody if they had all these weapons, metallic weapons, the newest technology, all of this, and all you had were some sticks? That was an overwhelming difficulty. Another thing, too, is that they didn't have a, they didn't have a priest. You look at Saul there, verse 3, Ahijah who was wearing an ephod. Now, an ephod in that day was, was used for religious purposes. The, the priest would wear that, and he would be one who would call upon the Lord and, and present the battle plans and say, Lord, this is what we want to do. What do you want to do, Lord? And the one that wore the ephod would be the, the conduit that the Lord would use to speak to the king or the leader of the army. That's what they've got. They've got their own priest. But they name names here. And you see, if you look at the names and you do a little research and look at this, that the names that are listed were pretty rotten. Ichabod, his name means the glory has left. You see the, the, the name, the son of Phineas. Phineas was a priest that was corrupt. He would go in and when people would bring their offerings of meat and all these things, they would take the, be they would take the T bones. They would take the, all the best pieces of the meat and they would leave the, the other pieces for all the, the, the lower people. You see, he, Phineas was so offensive to God is that God just killed him himself. I mean, that's pretty bad. When you're so offensive to God that says, God says, I, you've, I've just had enough. Boom, dead. That's the kind of priest that Saul has with him. Jonathan does not have a priest. He does not have a religious garment. He doesn't have anybody famous with him. He's got this armor bearer who's most likely about a teenager. He's not a skilled swordsman or a skilled fighter at this point. It's kind of an on-the-job training kind of situation. So everything is pointing to the fact that there is overwhelming, overwhelming difficulty. On top of that, he's got no backup. Jonathan wants to go to war. He's going to be in the battle, and his dad and all of those troops are miles away. Miles away. He's got no backup. He's going into this. With the plan that only the Lord is going to take care of this. And that always seems to be the best plan when you look at the scripture. Another thing is that they had overwhelming and harsh landscape. Landscape. If you have those pictures. This was actually taken by a drone at the writing of the scriptures. Just kidding. They didn't have drones back then. There is a great website, though, called BiblePlaces.com. I found this on BiblePlaces.com. This is actually, so if you look back here, there's, that's the, the ancient town of what is Michmash. Okay? Here you see these big ravines. Now this is the pass. Because on the other side of this, there's another big ravine. The, the Philistines were all right here. That's where they were camping out. If you could keep people from going through the pass, then you could be very secure, and that's what the Philistines did. Show me the next picture. This is what they had to go through. In order to, this is one of the ravines that they would have to crawl up here and do their fighting. I mean, that is, 
that's a difficult way to fight. Right? They didn't have big ladders. They didn't have ways to just easily get across the ravine. And so just the, the geography of the whole place was just very difficult. All of these factors were going into the fact that these two guys, Jonathan and his armor bearer, were about to go into battle with everything against them into a battle that seemed unwinnable. Because if they reached the top, they were going to meet troops that were ten times their number. But the good thing is, is Jonathan wasn't alone. He had his trusty, anonymous armor bearer standing right there alongside of him. You see, life can be hard, right? Life goes in cycles. We understand that. There are cycles of, of blessing, right? That, man, everything's going well, right? And there are, there are times of, of battle in our lives. There's, you're fighting something, and somebody else is fighting something, and there's turmoil, and there's relationships, and there's work, and there, then, then there's own, our own health, and the things that we battle, and, and all of these things going on. Life is always going to be dirty. It's just the way it is, right? If anybody tells you other, if somebody has told you that if when you become a Christian that it becomes roses and rainbows, then they're lying to you. You see, when we become a Christian, it's the battles often become more intense, but we've got a commanding officer that kicks tail every chance we let him. You see, Jonathan has this great, faithful, trusted friend right beside him. Did you know that faith needs friends? Faith needs friends. Do you have or are you a trusted friend to somebody? A statistic came out a couple of weeks ago that was pretty shocking. We live now, for all this, the measurements that we can take, we live in, in one of the loneliest societies in history. Loneliest. The irony is we're more connected. We've got these little things that you can have in your hand that connects you to a million different people. But you see, those connections aren't real. You can be connected to a million people on Facebook, but if you don't have somebody to call when you've got a problem, then, then that's the big problem. Do you have a trusted friend that you can talk to? You see, we need trusted friends. Now, I want to put this out there too. Now, you're married, your, your spouse should be a good trusted friend, but they should not be your only trusted friend. Men, you need other men, friends, that walk the walk with you. Women, you need other women, friends, that walk the walk with you. It's important. We are not supposed to be just single fighters by ourselves in this battle that is life. That is not the way it's supposed to be. That's why the church was put together by Jesus, because we are here for each other. When you're in a battle... You have others that will come alongside of you and fight shoulder to shoulder with you. I've heard so many times that people, I don't have a good trusted friend. Nobody wants to be my friend. Well, have you tried to be a friend to somebody else? That's what we often neglect is, well, they don't want to be my friend. Well, you know what happens is we often need to take the first step. And be that friend to somebody else. Oh, well, they've probably got enough friends. But do they? Do you have enough friends? Can you ever have enough friends in the faith? No. Here we see Jonathan and the armor, his armor bearer had these extraordinary odds against them. But they had each other. They had each other. You may have heard of Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes was a billionaire, genius, 
Actually, I found out doing some research on this, he was actually the inspiration for Tony Stark from Iron Man. When Iron Man was created, Howard Hughes was the inspiration. At the time of Howard Hughes, at the, at the height of his, uh, his famousness, he was what would be equivalent to about two or three hundred billion now. That's how much money he had. He was brilliant. He invented all kinds of things. He would fly. I mean, he was doing stuff all the time. But at the end of his life, in one of his last interviews, they were talking to him about that. They said, how does it feel to live your whole life and accomplish all of these things? You've designed aircraft. You've flown all these things. And you have made these businesses and that have changed the world. And, and, all, and plus that, you're the richest man in the world. And very simply, Howard Hughes looked at him. And he said, you know what? He said, I would give it all for one true friend. Do you have one true friend? You need somebody that will tell you the truth. You don't need a bunch of yes people in your life. You need to tell somebody, and they need to tell you sometimes, that's, that's not right. That's what real friends are, is having the ability to tell you the truth that you need to hear. Jonathan had an armor bearer, this no-name guy, but it didn't matter because they were in it together. The next thing that we see is that there was great encouragement. Encouragement. That was his role. Jonathan, in verse 1, has a plan. Right? His plan is, come on, let's cross over to the Philistine garrison on the other side. That was his initial plan. Sounds kind of shaky. Let's just cross over to the Philistine garrison. That doesn't sound very good. I don't think you've got that very organized. And then you go jump over to verse 6, and then the plan is a little bit different. Jonathan says, come on, let's cross over to the garrison of these uncircumcised men. Perhaps the Lord will help us. Nothing can keep the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Plan's getting better. Now he's involving the Lord in the plan. And I think, just the way that I've been looking at this and praying about this, I think that he's kind of telling this plan to his armor bearer. Like, have you ever had a friend that has this harebrained scheme? Right? This friend that comes to you and says, I've got this fabulous idea. This is what I'm going to quit everything, and I'm going to be a professional surfer. <laughs> but they're looking to their friend to either affirm it or to not affirm it. I think David has made this plan, and he is kind of telling his armor bearer, Kind of like in a way that says, okay, what do you think about this? I mean, if the Lord goes with us, I mean, nobody can stop the Lord, right? Whether by many or by few, the Lord can do it all. And look at his response, verse 7. His armor bearer responded. He speaks. Do what is in your heart. You choose. I'm right here with you, whatever you decide. What a true friend. Now, I want to make this clear here. Do what is in your heart. We hear a lot of that today. Do whatever your heart wants you to do. No, don't do that. Right? Because the Bible says our heart is wicked beyond all things. Don't follow your heart. Bad advice. Follow your heart only when it is led by the Lord. That's when you follow your heart. And that's what the armor bearer is saying. He is testifying here. He says, you have already talked about the Lord. The Lord will make this battle happen. He's the one that's going to win it. And he says, do whatever the Lord is leading your heart to do. And he says, whatever you decide, if we're going to cross, I'm with you. If we're staying here, I'm with you. Isn't that great to have a friend that's right there with you that says, okay, Whatever you're going to decide on this, I am with you. 
You see, too many friends today are very fickle. Right? I've had friends over the years that, you know, boy, you don't do what they think you ought to do, then you just, they won't talk to you anymore. The armor bearer here was a true and trusted friend. He says, I am with you no matter what's coming. He already knows the difficulty. Now look at this. Jonathan has all the weapons. The armor bearer is carrying all the weapons. If he has any kind of weapon himself, it's wooden or it's stone. He knows when he hands off all of the armor and everything to Jonathan that he's going to have to do some fighting too. With sticks that are not metal. So he's involved in this decision too. You see, if you're a true friend, you're involved in those decisions. And if they're informed by the Lord, boy, those are the best decisions to run with. Understand this too. God has a lot of harebrained ideas that He gives us that are His direction that we're actually supposed to do. But it has to be from Him. It has to be from Him and not just your own harebrained idea. The armor bearer here is saying, I'm with you. You want to go, I am with you. I'm holding your armor, I am here, whatever you need. We need to be those kind of friends. Have you talked to the Lord about this? I know you want to do this and it feels right to you. It feels like something you should do, but is that what the Lord wants you to do? We've got to be those friends that ask them, Are you, have you talked to the Lord about this first? If we talk to the Lord first about a lot of stuff, He keeps us out of a lot of problems. You see, this plan has just gotten better, right? Now his plan gets even better. He says, okay, this is what we're going to do. We'll cross over to the men and we'll let them see us. If they say, wait till we reach you, then we'll just stay where we are. But if they say, come on up, then we'll go up because the Lord has given them to us, has handed them over to us. That will be our son. You see, his plan got better and better and better with the encouragement that the Lord provided him through this person nobody knew. Did you know that you could change somebody's life just by encouraging them? The root word there is courage. He gave him courage to do what the Lord wanted him to do. You know, not everything is easy that the Lord wants us to do. Matter of fact, most of it's hard. We all need courage to do what the Lord calls us to do. And that's why we are called alongside of each other. Because we can encourage. To give courage to the people that need the courage. The people around us can give us courage when we need the courage to do it. He encouraged him and the plan just got automatically better. He's just like... If, if we stay here and they say, okay, we're coming down to you, we're just going to wait. But if they say, come on up, that means the Lord has already won the victory. We're going for it. You see, there is an encouragement lack in our world. Right? We need to be friends that encourage one another. We need to speak the truth in love, but we need to throw some encouragement in there too. One of my favorite comic strips is Peanuts, Charlie Brown. Great comic strip one day, there was Peppermint Patty and her little friend Marcy. Peppermint Patty had a problem. She says, you know, I'd like to read a book, Marcy, but I'm kind of afraid. He said, she said, my, my granddad always didn't encourage reading. As a matter of fact, he said that when you read too much, that your head would fall off. So Marcy said, well, sir, you start the first chapter of that book, and I'll hold your head. <laughs> that needs to be us. It needs to be us encouraging one another, being friends, true, godly friends, through the, through the thick of the battle, through the waters and through the fire. 
encouragement. We need to encourage one another. Next thing we see is the faith-fueled battle. Faith-fueled battle. They said, okay, we're going to do this. We've got the plan. Verse 11, they let themselves be seen by the Philistines. The Philistine says, come on up. Bunch of hiding wimps. Come on, we'll show you. We'll teach you a lesson or two. And look what happens here. Jonathan says, follow me, for the Lord has handed them over to Israel. You see that? They're taunting them. There's ten times their number waiting for them at the top of the ravine. Jonathan says, ha we got them right where we want them. He says, follow me, and we're going to take care of this because the Lord has already handed us the victory. But I want you to see this. Verse 13, Jonathan climbed up using his hands and feet with his armor bearer behind him. I thought victories were supposed to be easy. I thought when the Lord handed them over to them, then they would just fall down dead and we don't have to do anything about it. Lunchtime. They knew that the Lord was going to hand them over to them, but they still had to crawl up the side of that ravine with their hands and their feet. Even when the Lord is starting to give you a victory in your life, understand still there is time to climb up the hill. You have to keep climbing up the hill. Jonathan says, follow me. Now, if you look at this, the armor bearers got the bad deal. Jonathan gets to climb unencumbered because this teenager is behind him and he's got all of the stuff loaded up on him and he's having to climb up behind him. What an armor bearer. In today's world, they'd be like, nope, sorry. That's, I might sweat. Here's your stuff. Climb up yourself. We'll see how it goes. But no, he's stuck behind him, even carrying the majority of the weight. They climbed up the side of the ravine with their hands and their feet. And they get all the way to the top, and look what happens. Jonathan climbed up. Armor bearer behind him. Jonathan cuts them down. And his armor bearer followed and finished them off. In that first assault, Jonathan and his armor bearer struck down about 20 men in a half acre field. After all of that climbing. After getting to the top. Being completely exhausted. The Lord gave them the victory. Because it wasn't their strength they were fighting in. It was in his strength that they were fighting. And never forget that. We fight in his strength. He provides the victory. When we fight in our strength, there's always defeat. They still climbed up. They get up there. Armor bearer gets all the stuff, puts it on. Jonathan says, you look great. Go to town. He takes his sword and he cuts down the majority of them. And the armor bearer gets to be involved in the battle too. It says he cleaned up what was left over. He learned a lot from Jonathan in this one battle. You see, in a good Christian friendship, we learn a lot from each other. It's the way it should be. Iron sharpens iron. That's not just for men. That's for ladies. That's for everybody. There was great victory, and it was a faith-fueled victory. It was not in their own strength. It was by the Lord's hand, and they, there's no way they could have got to the top exhausted from climbing out of that ravine and fought and won in any other way but how the Lord wanted that to happen. No matter what obstacles you're fighting today, if you lean upon the Lord and give, you, give your life to Him in every decision, He will give you the strength for the victory. He will. Not only that, but look at the next verse. Verse 15. Terror spread through the Philistine camp. The open fields to all the troops, even the garrison and the raiding parties were terrified. The earth shook and terror spread from God. 
look at this. You've got Jonathan. He's courageous in his own right, but he's got this armor bearer alongside of him that we don't know his name. Because they had this faith-fueled battle. They believed in the Lord. They, they did what the Lord told them to do. They get up there. They take care of business. And that courage spread all over. These two changed the course of the war. Two people. One of them we know his name. One is anonymous. Change the course of the war. The Philistines said to themselves, man, if those two can do that, what does the rest of the Israelite army fight like? And they became afraid and the terror of the Lord spread. You will never know the impact of your friendships with others. I think until we get to heaven. There may be something going on that will ripple throughout time in history that you may not understand until after you get to heaven. And you can see, well, all I did was encourage that person. All I did was pray for them that they would come to know Christ. All I did was this. But look what happened downstream from that. Never, ever underestimate what God can do with our simple acts of obedience. Because these two men were obedient to the Lord. They won the victory, and that victory spread over miles and miles and miles and miles and miles. You see, that's what the Lord wants to do with us. He wants to change the world around us by using little old us. But you see, there's no such thing as little old us. Because we've got the Lord. Us and the Lord can do anything. So don't sit there thinking, well, yeah, but that's those people. I mean, the Lord doesn't want to use me. I'm not significant in any way. I just go about my business. Well, that's the business that God, that the Lord has you doing. He has planted each of us where he's planted us for his purposes. When we follow him and obey him, we will do things in the kingdom of God that, that he wants us to do and that will ripple throughout history and time. Don't underestimate what the Lord can do with you. Let the Lord encourage you too. There was a gentleman walking through the park one day and he gets, gets up and there's, there's a ball field. And so he's walking around and, and it's these little boys playing baseball. And oh, it's just so fun to watch. And he stops by one of the dugouts and he asks one of the little guys, he said, hey, how's the game going? The little guy says, we're down 18 to nothing. The man says, well, he said, boy, you don't seem very discouraged. He said, yeah, we haven't even come to bat yet. No matter what odds you face, no matter how much it looks uphill, no matter if you're lacking weapons, no matter if you've got a no-name friend next to you, it doesn't matter. If you've got the Lord, you've got everything you need. And if you've got the Lord, he wants you to encourage somebody next to you. Are you a good friend to people around you? Are you waiting? Waiting to find that perfect one friend that won't let you down. Well, there's none of those. Because we're all knuckleheads. We're good friends. You know, we're, we're pretty good friends 90% of the time. But that other 10%. We can't expect perfection from our friends because then that would mean that they expect perfection from us and we can't deliver. Are you a good friend? Are you a good faithful friend? Are you a good godly friend? Is your faith growing because of your friends around you? Understand if you only have friends that are not believers, they will usually drag you back. 
You've got to be that friend that has encouragement for others. See, this all starts with the best friend. Jesus is the friend that is closer than a brother. All this starts, the only way Jonathan, the only way that they can fight with the presence of God and the strength of God is because of Christ in us. You think, well, Jesus didn't live back then. Well, he was alive. He's been alive forever. Jesus is fully God. He was right along there with them. Some of you today are having trouble with friendships and things like that because you don't have the one friend that you need to start it all off, and that is Jesus. Jesus is the friend that will never leave you, never forsake you. He is so much your friend that he died on the cross for your sins. Even while we were still sinners doing what we do, Christ died for us knowing that we don't deserve it. But because of his great love for us, he gave of himself literally, sacrificially. So that we, when we put our faith in him, when we repent of our sins and say, God, forgive me. Forgive me, Lord, for all of my sin. His death on the cross and his resurrection allows him to say, all of your sin is forgiven. All of it. Every single sin and more is gone because of what he did on the cross. Today could be the day of your salvation. Today could be the day that God changes everything. Today's the day that the Lord could, he brought you here today to hear his message today, to hear from his word so that he can get a hold of you and tell you, I love you so very much. I have provided a way to you get, for, for you to get out of these chains. I have provided a way for you to get out from under all that burden. I have provided a way for you to have joy and love and peace. I have found a way and provided a way for you. But we have to reach out to that. We have to say, Lord, I, I put my faith in you. Forgive me of my sins. And he comes and he saves us. He puts the spirit of God inside of us. You'll never be alone again. And the spirit of God inside of us helps us each day to walk with him. To know what to do next. To lead us and to understand how to live this life. But today is that first day that you need to put your faith in Christ. As believers today, it's so easy to get distracted by everything in the world and not to be a good friend. And then we can get bitter because nobody's been a good friend to us. You need to put that bitterness behind and give that to the Lord. And you need to step out and be a good friend to somebody that needs it. Scripture tells us that we are to think of others as more important than ourselves. See, just imagine what would happen if we actually, all of us, started treating other people like they were more important than we were. What would happen? I invite you today as believers in Christ to recognize that maybe you don't have good friends in the faith, but you need them. You need them. Maybe you need to come and, and, and have prayer. We will pray with you. We want to bear your burden with you. You're not supposed to bear it alone. That's why the church is so important in this world is that we are here with each other, for each other. Knuckleheads, every single one of us imperfect, but in need of a Savior every moment. Well, I invite you to come. If you need prayer today, we will pray with you. God's brought you here. What's going to happen? Do what God had asked you to do.